This is Jay. Listen to me get personal about healthcare and other political issues as a guest on Healthcare is a Life Issue, episode 30 of The Podcasting Couch with Chris Carlson. Sit down with Chris as he interviews podcasters, musicians, and other general content creators and get to know their stories, background, inspirations, and whatever else may happen to come up in the conversation. I have listened to a number of episodes. And as a fan of various types of podcasts, the Podcasting Couch is a great place to learn about different podcasts and other creative content. The Podcasting Couch can be found on Apple Podcasts and many other podcatchers. We have a link posted on our website. Check it out, listen, and subscribe. Now, time for today's episode of Potster Podcast. Potster Podcast, where politics, religion, and history collide, and it's not always polite. I am your host, Jay Poole. Today, I will be joined by a guest, Allison K. Garcia. She is the author of the highly rated novel, Vivier El Dream. She is a member of American Christian Fiction Writers, Shenandoah Valley Writers, Virginia Writers Club, and is Municipal Liaison for Shenandoah Valley NaNoWriMo. Allison's short story, At Heart, was published in the Winter 2013 edition of From the Depths Literary Magazine, along with her flash fiction. Her work, You Shall Receive, was published in Greyhaven Comics' 2014 All Women's Anthology. For her novel, Vivir El Dream, Allison finaled in the 2016 ACFW Genesis Contest. Latina at heart, Allison has been featured in local newspapers for her connections in the Latino community in Harrisonburg, Virginia. She is a licensed professional counselor who is involved in cultural competency committees for work, has participated in several Dream Act rallies and other events, and she is very much involved in her church and in her community. Allison, it is definitely an honor to have you here on Pot Stirrer Podcast. Thank you very much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. So tell me a little about yourself and how you got into writing. Well, um, I have been interested in writing since I was little. I always wanted to be a writer. I can be, I can remember being like, I don't know, like five or six years old and writing little books and stuff. And I actually went to college for writing, for creative writing, um, and then, but just wasn't, wasn't enjoying it in college. Like, I kind of lost my love of writing in college and switched over to psychology, I joke and say, to heal my soul (laughs) from the horrible (laughs) writing classes. (laughs) So, um, you know, uh, uh, so I, (laughs) and so, but I really feel like it was like the right way to go because at the moment I thought it was really horrible because I was losing this thing that I, I didn't know who I was if I wasn't a writer. But now, all these years later, I kind of realized that changing over to psychology and then becoming a counselor and learning, like hearing people's stories and, and like meeting the people where I live now in Harrisonburg, Virginia. I'm from New Jersey originally. And just meeting this great community here. I feel like God kind of put all these things here so that I can write the book, Vivia El Dream. And kind of, it kind of brought my love of writing back and gave me a reason to write something. That's, that's awesome. I mean, it, and I can definitely relate with the whole idea of getting into something and then, okay, later on, like, eh, well, I'm going to do something else. <laughs> and then coming back to what you really love. Mm-hmm. With with politics, I grew up loving politics, and then, and then later on, I ended up deciding like, uh, I don't know, and, and then I went into the private sector. Mm-hmm. And is there still that whole like, yeah, I would really like to be involved, and so this is kind of a way to do that. And so I can, yeah, so I can definitely relate at least on that level, of like kind of coming back to something that you really enjoy. Yeah, it's like coming back home almost. Like this is like it felt right, like. But I know that if I had just gone straight into writing, 
that I I wouldn't have gathered all of these experiences that made me a better writer, really. And so I figured, well, God knew what he was doing. <laughs> so. <laughs> I hear you. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so, so, like, as we've kind of talked about, uh, you wrote and self-published this book called Vivir El Dream. And it's a novel that is woven in Christian faith and touches on a number of themes like economic insecurity, undocumented immigration, cultural communication, empathy, hope. And so having a chance to, to read the novel, like it's evoked a lot of emotions for me. Like, and it's made me feel just really kind of feel these issues a bit more. What made you write the book? Well, it's a lot of things that led me to write the book. I think one is, the main reason is I really have been inspired by all of the people that I have met, all of the undocumented people that I have met, um, and the documented people in the Latino community as well. I've just, you know, seeing people's faith, in times of great struggle and like and and seeing that unfailing faith was something for me that was really really like touching and inspiring and it actually helped me when I've gone through you know tough times later and so that was a, an element that I really wanted to portray in the book that idea of of not letting go of your faith in times of really really tough struggle it's interesting, um, you know, when you, you get a different perspective when you talk, the more people you talk to, the more it really opens your eyes and you get a bigger perspective of things. And for me, there's been, I've just had so many eye opening stories because you don't know what you don't know. And then when you start talking to people and you hear people's stories, you know, of why they've come to this country, all the things they've had to go through to get here, um, I've heard, you know, I've worked with um, women that have been sexually trafficked here. I've worked with people leaving abusive situations like Juanita in my story. I've worked with people, I've talked to people that have had some really traumatic things happen to them on their border crossings, like people almost dying in the desert. Like a lot of these things that are in the book are things that I've heard of from people. It's not like one person's story. It's like, I try to, I kind of like, you know, I'm, some of it's, you know, invented, but a lot of it are, these are like real things. So people sometimes say, is this some, like a real story? And I say, well, it's a lot of people's real stories because these are real things that happen to people. You know, these are reasons why people come. Like some people just come because they want a better life. And that's why my ancestors came here, you know, to give their family a better life and stuff. But there's sometimes there's bigger reasons. Sometimes the crossings can be really, really bad. And then when you're here, it's not all, um, you know, roses and like a beautiful rose garden like you think it's like going to be easy. And then like people are hit with a lot of racism and prejudice and just so many different things. And a lot of that are things that inspired the story. And um, for me, a very direct influence for inspiring the story was um, my church family. Um, I found, like, a really great church here, and I actually go to the Spanish-speaking service called Alianza, and um, we love our church so much, and there's just so many amazing people there, such, like, strong faith. Several years ago, I think it was, like, maybe 2011, I, I don't, I'm a little vague on the timeline, but, um, like, right around that time, we actually had, like, three church members get deported in, like, the span of one year, and it was... It was like really, really sad. Like I don't, I like prior to that, I never had met anybody that had gotten deported. Like I didn't know, I had never met anybody. And one of the people from our church, he got deported back to El Salvador, where he's from. And he was like, our, he was our friend. the The whole family, like they, they were amazing. They're amazing people, and. He was a big member of our church. Like, he would, you know, collect the offerings, set up the chairs, like, just be really encouraging and talk to people and just, like, smiling all the time. And, like, yeah, he was just, they were just, they were just awesome. They're still awesome. And when, he, like, he, the whole situation was he went to the national park with his family to celebrate Father's Day, and there was, like, a checkpoint. And, 
they they found out that he didn't have papers and the police they were so rough with him that it like traumatized the kids because like they threw him on the vehicle and stuff which was not necessary because he was not violent like the person at all and you know it was so sad because these kids that like grew up you know with us in the church like that you know they were so small and then like you know it was a few years later they grew up with us like to see them that uh like when a police siren would would go off they would like start crying it was like yeah. really it was heartbreaking and so and then you know when he got deported and he was, well and he, when he was in the de- deportation center you know he had he wrote us letters um like and they read it aloud in church like in the book and it really like it reminded me as they he like the pastor was reading them aloud like it reminded me of like Paul's letters in the Bible like cuz yeah. like you just like like when you think about it like like I don't know if I could be that strong to be like in prison or in jail and to be like hey guys you know like thank you for your prayers and you know don't worry about me I'm doing fine you know like and yeah. you know like he was uh, like he was so strong in his faith and like I remember him saying like no matter what happens it's God's plan and that um you know that 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 if he had to go back to El Salvador that um he was bringing the best gift back with him and that was his faith that he never had before um and so that was like amazing but also heartbreaking at the same time because you thought you know that's gonna like he's leaving everything that you know he had known he'd been here a really long time and then his family had to go back with him because they didn't want him to be there all by himself and so they all went back and um but it was so dangerous that they had to come back here um but his like they got their papers fixed and everything and they were able to come back but he's still there and that's like seven years later and so like part of this book you know really i and i have a dedication to him in the back that it's his strength was something that really inspired me his faith and i actually spent like a like a couple hours talking to him um bef- like when i was in the final like editing stages of my book because i wanted to make sure that i was being accurate with the deportation center and the process of like legal process and stuff um and and we just had a really great time catching up but it's it's so hard to know that he's there and like you know his family is here still and it's i just i'm just hoping that when people read my book they realize this is like real things that happen to people and that we need some change because things are you know not great for the immigration laws right now that's uh wow with something like that like being able to to share that and especially like having to like going through something like that then also having the faith Mm -hmm. to hold on to during the storm during all that like that's such that's so powerful like that's Mm -hmm. really powerful i noticed as far as the book i noticed that the characters were like just really well fleshed out it really it felt like seeing like it was like seeing through their eyes and what i really liked about the novel and this is especially in light of the immigration debate going on these days is just this humanizing really making real of not just those that are children that arrive like when they arrive in the u.s like not just you know what you know people call like daca kids right right but those who were adults who made the choice to risk so much to come over here undocumented you know oftentimes with their children and i think sometimes those stories do get overlooked when we talk about this issue even those of us that support the dream act and daca you know so i mean i think sharing those perspectives not just from the perspective of somebody like linda in the novel but also Juanita, seeing that, and and then I think just you know sharing some of those stories. These are real people that this is affecting. 
And I think it's so important for, for people to understand that. Yeah, I think that when we don't talk to people about it, we can make a lot of assumptions about, you know, why people are coming here. And it's easy when you're, like, looking from really, really far away. You can kind of make up your own story about people. But I really encourage people to just go and talk to people, listen to people's stories, maybe even watch, like, documentaries or things like that. There's a really cool documentary called, um, I think it's called, like, the Beast, about these kids coming from, it's a documentary, so it's like a real thing, is about these kids coming from, I think it's El Salvador or Honduras, and they're like, taking this giant freight train, and like, so many people die, and it's like, it's and it's a real thing, like, they follow them on the whole train thing, you know, like, this is real stuff, and if you, I mean, if you watch it, the trains are like, I have never seen that many people, like, hanging off the side of a vehicle, like, it's just like, and you think, like, that's so many hundreds of people. And that's, like, I mean, and you know, like, you're getting on that train and you're getting, you, you could die. Like, people died, like, every day in that movie, in that documentary. And, like, that's some desperation right there. And, and I think, like, as, like, you know, I, and I'm an American, like, I think as an American, like, we've not experienced that level of desperation. And so we're quick to judge other people and to think like, oh, you know, why didn't they just stay there? But we don't know because we haven't been in those shoes. I'm like, I've never felt that level of desperation that I'm willing to like, you know, totally die to leave the town that I'm in or something, you know, for a better. I've, ne I've never felt that level of desperation. And I think a lot of us have never felt that level of desperation. And so I, tr you know, that's one of the things I tried to show in the book that there's there are reasons why people come why people leave their country it's really hard i think to leave your country because you love it but then there's things about it like maybe, you know that are hard um and it's i think that the more we listen to people and talk to people and understand and try to put ourselves in other people's shoes that really that's um that makes the biggest difference i think yeah i definitely agree with agree with that because i mean i and i agree with you like i mean i know i never i've never had that level of desperation in my life but like just imagining because i mean most people like you settle somewhere and like this is like where you're from and especially like your country i would think that for most people it would take a lot to decide that you know what this isn't going to work and especially under those circumstances because I think a lot of people talk about, like, well, why can't they wait for X amount of time and try to do it legally and these right. arguments? But I mean, the level of desperation to, we have to do is not, I can't, I can't afford to wait kind of thing. And to risk so much as far as like life and like, yeah, really putting your life on the line. Yeah. Like not really knowing like what's going to be on the other side. Like you, you know, you have like ideas maybe, but you really don't know. It's a bit great unknown. I mean, I've spoken to people, and, and also, you don't know if you're going to be able to cross the border, either. I I have, like, I know somebody, and she she says she she tried, like, three times before she was able to, to get over successfully. And then what happens is, because, you know, you're here, and you either had, like, a really tough time coming over the border, or it's not really safe to, like, to cross anymore... The, I mean, also right now, like, you can also, I've, I've actually spoken to two people that have had family members kidnapped at the border by gangs, Mexican gangs, and mm -hmm. so that's a whole other kitten caboodle, but, like, yeah. once you're here, then you're, like, here, like, you've pretty much, like, you can't go back, because if you go back, then you're not really going to be able to come back again, so I, you know, I've, I, there's so many people that they just, they don't have any family there anymore, because they've all passed away, like, some people, they haven't seen their parents for like 20 years, you know, because they can't go back to visit. But sometimes people, I mean, and I've heard this so many times that their fam their mother or their father or their grandmother dies and they can't go home for the funeral, you know, like because they'll never they'll never be able to come back again and they'll have to like leave their whole family here. If they have US born kids or something, you know, then what do you do with that? It's there's just so there's so many stories um and it's, it's like, and I think people just don't understand that. That's one of the reasons I wanted to write the book too, is that is seeing the judge, the judgment from people and 
it makes me extra sad, like, as a Christian to see it from the Christian community. Because, like, Jesus was, like, pretty specific <laughs> about you know, loving your neighbor and not yeah. saying, you know, who's our neighbor and who's not our neighbor. Like, he, like, had a whole section about that, uh, about the Samaritan. So it's, it makes me sad for people to be like, oh, they need to go back there. Because uh, uh, that's not very loving. <laughs> so kind of going off of that. I know that people of faith have had varied experiences with their churches regarding immigration and other political issues, especially with the bigoted rhetoric that the president has used to talk about minority ethnic and religious groups and the policies that the Trump administration has supported, like the rolling back of DACA and then some other issues like these bans on immigrants from majority Muslim countries, things like that. And It sounds like from what you've mentioned that your church has been pretty supportive of the immigrant community. Like, Oh, yeah. Well, I think, yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, no, go ahead. Yeah. uh, Our, I mean, I, I go, the church that we go to has, well, there's like the English, the English service. There's two English services and then there's a Spanish service. And so, um, but the, at the Spanish service, we have people from lots of different Latin American countries and a lot of American people like me, you know, and a lot of, I guess it was called like, like mixed marriages and stuff. Cause like my husband is from Mexico, the pastor, he's from Mexico and his wife is American. And like, just like we have a lot of, and, and I, I think that's really great because it, it's showing right there, like that there's no like, I don't want to say there's no color, like, in God's eyes, but everybody, there's no reason to not love different people and to to be against people from from being from one country or from another country. Like, that's not, none of that is in in Jesus' teachings. The other day, like, our pastor was talking about this one quote from, from Revelations where they're saying, like, every, every nation, every tongue. And that's like the final days of talking about heaven and, uh, and I'm not, I'm, Revelations isn't my, my favorite book, so I don't know <laughs> a lot, but I mean that, uh, and he's like, you know, that's the, that's the final thing. That's not saying, cause he was responding to the racism in Charlottesville, which is about 45 minutes from where we live. And, oh, wow. you know, and then people spouting all of that. There's like all these people spouting things that. I don't know if they're quoting from the Bible or they're like pretending that somehow God has said something about white people being better or something. I don't know where, like, there's like nothing in the Bible about that. So like, right. (laughs) But they, they will use stuff like that and say, this is what the Bible says. And so our pastor was, you know, reminding us that, you know, it doesn't matter what those people are saying. Like, we know really who wins the war in the end and that. That really, like, and when we see the end, it doesn't look white. It looks, like, multicolored and multilinguished languages, you know, and it's um, because everybody is, like, that's, uh, we're all God's children, and it doesn't matter what color our skin is, what language we speak, that doesn't matter in God's eyes, and so that's what we preach, you know, they preach at our church, too, like, that that doesn't matter. What matters is the actual teachings <laughs> of the Bible. So while, like, my pastor is, I think, and I think it's a good way, is very careful not to say, well, vote for this person or vote for that person, because I don't think that's good. They're saying, you know, he's very good at saying like this, that's not biblical. Uh, and then right. this is, you know, and I think that that's a really, I think, you know, when we try to step too far or make up our own ideas about stuff um, and don't really go to the, like actual stuff that's in there, <laughs> right. like it, that's when people kind of, start to do or or like make up their own ideas and it's just our own stuff getting in the way I think really so um, that's something I love about my I've learned so I learned a lot like I've been just I grew up in the church but I feel like I've learned so much because it's very it's very like I don't know he's uh, he's just he's really good uh, at his uh, preaching so that's that's nice for me (laughs) in our church (laughs) yeah like that's the thing like I know like some people have different experiences my church probably isn't as racially diverse, but I'm Black American, and but like my church is predominantly white. But like I don't feel like uncomfortable in my church. My pastors are outspoken about the things that are going on right now, and aren't afraid to to speak truth to power. Yeah, and, I mean, you know yeah. that's so you know that's so important. 
I think it's, it is, it's really important because it's a, I feel like it's kind of a scary time. Like it wasn't. And then all of a sudden there it was again. It was a scary time to be, it's, you know, a scary time to be here. I think because, I mean, I, and I, and I, I was worried right away when like in Trump's, one of his first campaign speeches, when he called like all Mexicans rapists and murderers, I was like, uh, yeah, this guy is super racist. Um, and yeah. then, and then like, it was just like really weird because I was like, and he was like, let's deport everybody and the, and the children of immigrants, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, and, and then like, it, it was so strange because like I had family and that, that are, were like totally like, like voted for Trump or like Trump supporters. And, and I was like, you you realize that he's calling to like deport your grandchild, you know, like, <laughs> like, are you not seeing that your son-in-law is this, that like, he's saying that all of your son-in-law and his, all of his people are rapists and murderers. And it's just like, it's such a strange disconnect for me. And so like, I, I, like for me, it's, it, it was very disheartening, I think, to, to see that, that he got elected because then, and I, and, and I, and I know, like, myself, like, being, um, being white, I don't understand as much as somebody that is a person of color. But I found myself, like, looking at everybody different the day after the election. Like, is this somebody that voted and said that they hate my husband and his people? Or, and my, my child, who will one day be a Latino, you know, man? Like, right now he's just a Latino toddler and everyone thinks he's cute, but one day he'll be a Latino man and maybe, that right. people will think it's okay to shoot him and say that it was well, because he was being violent or something, you know, when he wasn't. And I think, like, so it makes me, it made me, like, really second guess, like, because I started thinking, like, every other person I see is, like, someone that voted for that and were okay with that. And so that was, I found, like, that was really scary. Plus, and I'm sure you've noticed uh, um, that, that there's just the people that were, like, covertly racist or prejudiced this has given them the little push to be overtly prejudiced and it's just like and that's why i think i think things like the charlottesville thing happened and i mean it's just really scary it is it's a scary time it is i mean i think of i live in in cincinnati ohio but like i grew up in detroit and the way i grew up i grew up around like different you know, different cultures, especially like a lot of Arab Americans, a lot of Chaldeans, people that were from the Middle East. There's pretty large like Middle Eastern enclave in, in that area. And so some of these things that, that were coming out with when Trump was campaigning and like just targeting people that I grew up around, family, friends, colleagues, friends of mine, people that I know. And it's like, are, like, are you serious? You know, <laughs> but, but yeah. And, and yeah. And then at the same time, yeah. Like there are people that were, that were emboldened by his mm -hmm. rhetoric. Yeah. yeah. That's a good word for you know, it. But, but I think at the same time, like I think the church has a responsibility to, to speak out and to be a leader against some of this stuff. So, Going back to the whole faith perspective, like what, so what can, what do you think communities of faith could do to better support both undocumented immigrants and just in general ethnic minorities that are being targeted by Trump's administration? Hmm. I think that's a really good question. Um, I think, I think there's like so many things that we can do. And a lot of times, I, don't, I mean, I don't think that they have to be big things. Because, you know, sometimes they do have to be, like, sometimes I think, you know, sometimes it takes a big thing. And sometimes it's just a lot of little small things. I know, for me, that could be just smiling at somebody and being nice to someone. Because if you're, like, in a community where there's a lot of racism or prejudice, you know, um, you're probably getting a lot of bad looks. And so somebody's smiling at you and just saying hi maybe in that person's language or something, although you can't really assume someone's language, but like, you know, being nice to somebody is, is like a great, I think, step, like a good first step. It could be like having like a, a dinner or like a little in, invitation to the, like the community. 
um, maybe with like if there's like a certain culture that's more prevalent in your community, it could be like I guess it would have to be like you know like decide what like what kind of food that would maybe be interesting to that culture. Like if it was from Mexico, then be like oh like we're gonna have tamales or something, you know. Um, uh, and I think really. I don't know, like, there's, I think there's so many, there's, like, probably the ideas are endless, but just being welcoming, um, maybe even going out into the community and maybe meeting people where they are, you know, showing them that you're not judging them, showing, especially, like, with the undocumented population, there's so much fear around it, which I tried to, you know, represent that in the book, too, you know, like, for us, uh, and it kind of depends on the area where you are but like for us there has, there's like a lot of trailer parks where we live and so that's like they'll have like the after school program for the and then a lot of the kids from like the trailer park or from the apartment complex will go to that and then that's a way to minister right there I think because you're you know doing something that helps the community um and are showing love in a, a small way or or like I mean it, it really it could be so many different things, you know, just be loving and be nice and talk to people and get to know them and just sit down and have real conversations with people and listen and, and, and be non-judgmental. And I think that that's a really good beginning. Sounds good. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. So kind of switching up a little bit, do you have any future novels or projects in the works that we should watch for? Well, yes, I have another book called Finding Amor, and that book is in the editing process right now. So I'm hoping it for it to be out in 2018. That's my that's my idea about that, and that is about one of the boys that that came on the train like from El Salvador, and he's coming to meet his mom, who he's never really met before because she left to come like to the U.S. Um, when he was just like an infant. And then, so they're trying to, like, figure out what it's like to be a family, even though they've never met, really. You know, so so it's a little bit about that, plus another, um, like, a church member who gets wrangled into helping with the after-school program. And kind of it opens her eyes about some of the immigrant community around her. And so that's that's the book that um, I'm, is going to be coming out next. Plus I have, a, like, a children's fantasy series that... Probably will be starting to come out in like 2019 or so. Right. That sounds awesome. Definitely looking forward to that. I want to make sure I honor your time. And so last thing before we finish, is there anything else that you'd like to share with our listeners? Well, one is I just really appreciate you taking the time to talk with me today. And if people want to get out there and read my book, it's available on Amazon and So far, people seem to be enjoying it. Uh, It has almost all, it has all five stars except for like one four star. I I think that it would be great if people read it and like, you know, let me know what they thought. Even if you hate it, that's okay too. (laughs) Because I I, I just hoped that by, you know, reading the book, you kind of get into the character. Like you were saying, you get to feel what they're feeling and see what they're seeing, what they've been through. And... And that can just open your mind about stuff and kind of change, you know, the way you might think about stuff. I've actually had, like, some really surprising results with some people that are, are fairly conservative that I wouldn't think would ever have read the book or would and would have totally hated it. But they actually really liked it and said they couldn't put it down and it really opened their, their eyes to stuff. And so I thought that was, like, super awesome. Um, and so that's kind of one of the reasons I wrote the book. So that was pretty cool. Awesome. And I mean, I would definitely say like reading the book myself, like I, you know, like I really, I really enjoyed it. It's well written and I mean, definitely well done. So listeners definitely read this. Allison, thanks so much for coming on to the show. It's really been an honor. Oh, well, thank you so much. It was really nice talking with you. Listeners, make sure you go on Amazon and get Vivir El Dream by Allison K. Garcia. It is well written and perspective changing. Definitely worth the read. Remember to engage and get to know your neighbors and be good to other people in your community, even those you see as different from yourself. Also, 
be sure to call and write your senators and members of Congress voicing your support for the renewal of DACA and comprehensive and compassionate immigration reform. Check out our website today, potswearpodcast.com, for previous episodes, special presentations, announcements, merch, and all things Potstir Podcast. You can find our show on iTunes, Google Play, and most other podcatchers. If you enjoy the show, please subscribe, give us five stars, leave a review, share, and tell your friends. Thank you for listening and supporting Potstir Podcast. I'm Jay Poole. Let's fight for America's future because freedom is not free.